It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators. The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here's Douglas Coleman. Okay, please welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show, Dr. William R. Forston. Hello, how are you? Hey, doing good today. Is it hot out there today? Yeah, you know, it's it's funny. We've been having this sort of heat wave all across the country, and a lot of people are complaining about the heat, but it's always this hot in Las Vegas. We haven't experienced anything but our normal hot summer, <laughs> you know, so it's... It's 100 degrees, you know, and it's uh, 11 o'clock in the morning, but that's very typical for August. Yeah, well, uh, hello from the mountains in North Carolina, where it's 75. Oh, well, that's and beautiful. And windy and nice. Yeah. I suppose if you're not used to it, you know, people will complain about it. Yeah. But you don't get people complaining about the heat too much in Vegas <laughs> in the summertime. Uh, they shouldn't be there if it, they do. So, well, exactly. And it's you who live there. Yeah. 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 And it's worse in Arizona. Yes. Anyways, so you are a best selling New York Times author. You've got a book series out. The series is called One Second After. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And the book that we've got here is called Five Years After. Now, that's the fourth book in the series? Yes, it is. Okay. The first book, One Second After, I, I see that it has an introduction by Newt Gingrich. Uh, how do you know Mr. Gingrich? Oh, gosh. Newt and I have been friends for 30 years, oh. uh, long before he became Speaker of the House. you got to remember, he was a his history professor before he went into Congress. And, you know, after he left the speakership, well, we wrote nine books together you oh, know, really? about history and such. Oh, okay. And he's the one that encouraged and he's the one that encouraged me to write one second after. Are you also a professor? Is that what you did prior to yes. publishing yeah. the books? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, before, during, and even now. Uh, I'm professor professor at Montreat College, small Christian college up here in the mountains of uh, North Carolina, just outside Asheville. All right. What are you teaching? History, of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I see military history is your sort of your forte. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah, that's. Uh, I have a PhD in history, specializing in military history, and then also in the history of technology. Well, let's kind of dive right into this because I'm sure a lot of people sure. may not know what it is. the uh, The theme that runs through this book series is something called EMP or electromagnetic yeah. pulse. Can you just describe what that is? This type of weapon. Sure, sure. Basic primer on EMP. EMP, shorthand for electromagnetic <clears throat> pulse weapon. It's created by lofting a nuclear weapon uh, top a missile, put it above the United States, detonated at 200 miles up. It sets up an electrostatic discharge known as the Compton effect, that when it hits the Earth's surface a split second later, the lights go out. It shorts out the electrical grid. In a test out in Hawaii in 1962, they blew uh, a one megaton weapon about 400 miles south of the Hawaiian Islands. It blew out a fair part of the Hawaiian grid. That's when we realized this is a very dangerous weapon. Worst case scenario, put three such weapons above the United States, eastern, central, western United States, you shut down the grid for months, more likely for years. And here's the bad number. It's estimated that between 80 to 90 percent of Americans would die in the first year. Wow. Okay. Um, wow. It's Why? Well, that's the funny thing, because mankind has only lived with electrical power for about 150 years or so. Yes, yes. We lived for centuries without it and did just fine. Well, you know, that, that that's the bottom line. 150 years ago, nobody had a concept of this. But today, electricity around the world, it, it's there. We've had it for about 120 years, and it worked yesterday. It's called expectation and normalcy. Worked yesterday, worked today, of course it's going to work tomorrow. 
But imagine if it didn't work and shut down. And I'll, I'll start with a question to you. Where do you get your water from? When you got up this morning, how did you get your water? From the tap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you turn this mysterious knob and water comes out. Yeah. But realize that it's all hooked up to electrical systems of pumping stations, purification, waste disposal. So here's the bit, almost like a Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Every city will lose its water immediately, weeks, months even. Second, the average town only has about 20 days worth of food on hand. At the end of that, what do you do next? That's from what's in your fridge and melting to what's pulling up to the local supermarket. Medication, pharmacies are all shut down. Petrol. It's estimated that somewhere between 10 up to 90% of autos will short out in the event of an EMP. Where do you even get your gas if it still works? Of course, disease, major situation, and then, of course, finally, command and control. What do the bad guys do when they realize the police no longer can function? Well, and then even the Army couldn't function very well, could we? It could not. Um, There's efforts, at least on some military uh, bases, to harden the structure, uh, hardening the infrastructure. It's kind of complex, better circuit breakers modernizing the wiring, things like that. But yeah, the military is going to be crippled as well, at least in the continental United States. So it's it's a bad situation all around. So this scenario would be different from a nuclear war in the sense that everybody would be alive, correct? I mean, the the electric would go out, but everybody would still be alive. Where if, if they detonated a nuclear bomb, uh, in the traditional sense, it would just wipe everybody out. Yeah. Uh, well, may I ask, how old are you? Uh, 61. <laughs> Had to think about okay. that. Uh, yeah, I- I'm 70. So, yeah, I grew up during the Cold War. It was mutual assured destruction. Right. Russia launches at us. We launch at them. Nobody wins. Well, this is a whole different paradigm. A rogue nation like North Korea who already does have ICBMs and does have nuclear weapons, they decide to do it to us. They can do it. It would take about 15 to 20 minutes to launch the detonation. There's very little we could do in that time to prevent it. So, yeah, you know, I actually heard more than one person say a full-scale nuclear war might be more humane because it will kill almost all of us in the first day rather than a slow death across the next year pretty sick thinking, but that's the way it is. Well, I suppose if you're faced with death and somebody says, do you want to die slow and painful or do you want to die quickly and instantly? Which one do you choose? I would choose, I have supplies in my house (laughs) and I can board it up if need be and I can survive at least the worst of it. And that's one of the messages I keep trying to get out. Everybody should have at least a month's worth of emergency supplies on hand. Food, water, medication, basic things. And the vast majority of Americans still don't do it. I just did an interview a couple of days ago down in Texas, and I asked the guy, of all the people you know, how many have a good stockpile in their house for storms? He said maybe 20%. The other 80%, they're going to wait for FEMA. It doesn't work that way in an EMP situation. It sounds like that it would be impossible to protect our country from an EMP attack, is it? No, it's not. And, okay, there's my big frustration. The electrical grid that we now operate on, according to a DOE report some years ago, the average component in our electrical grid is 40 to 50 years old, in the Northeast even older. By upgrading our systems, modernizing them, putting proper circuits, proper circuit breaker systems in, we could ameliorate a lot of this not doing it. We're spending a trillion dollars on green energy, but we're not spending anything on basic infrastructure. Uh, Another question for you. 90% of our major electrical components, where do you think they come from? You mean the the actual wiring and mechanics of it? The wiring, yeah, the transformers, especially the big transformers, which will be blown out. Where do you think the replacement parts come from? Well, I hate to say it, but probably China. 
You are absolutely right. <laughs> That's a no-brainer. <laughs> yeah. That, that isn't even a $100 question on Jeopardy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the analogy I give there is it's as if on December 7th, 1941, President's meeting with his Joint Chiefs of Staff, and one of them says, hey, Mr. President, we do have a problem tonight. All our aircraft carriers are made in Japan. All our planes are made in Germany. What are we going to do? That's the situation we're in now. We have lost our homegrown industrial capability for manufacturing crucial parts necessary for national security. We're not doing it. How much more severe would this be than a complete collapse of the Internet? <laughs> well, there's part of me that thinks maybe it wouldn't be so bad to lose the Internet for a week or two, <laughs> you know, especially, especially when I'm talking to my college students. Uh, yeah, maybe the IRS would lose my records. I don't know. But uh, that's just the Internet. We're talking about a universal shutdown of your air conditioning, your heating, everything that you, you throw an electrical switch for, it no longer works. Now we are back 150 years ago. But the difference is people 150 years ago knew how to live in that system. Right. We don't. Right. Solar panels on your roof, would those be immune? I'm told by some manufacturers that they do make them EMP proof. I, I couldn't answer that one correctly. Okay. I'm not sure. I'm suspicious that it won't because it's a large square footage area to receive a major high voltage blow, but some manufacturers claim they're taking care of that. I couldn't answer it for sure, though. So in the event of an EMP attack, is the electrical grid the only thing that's going to suffer directly from that? Yeah, yeah. You know, well, there's one other thing. Um, at this moment, as you and I are talking, if, if the FAA and weather is good today, we got about two to 3,000 airplanes crisscrossing the United States. What happens to them? Because most of them, especially the more modern 787s and such, they're completely dependent on, you know, computers. Below the computers, even if you have Sully, that famous pilot, sitting in the front seat, the stick isn't going to respond anymore. It, it just plummets to earth. A couple hundred thousand people could die in the first five minutes. It's interesting. Yeah, it's so, bad. Yeah. Uh, so the book series is a fictional account based on what we've been talking about. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, I based it largely on the 2002 congressional report, a later one, and talking to a heck of a lot of people, even including a former head of the CIA, who said this is his number one security concern. So, yeah, I did a lot of research before I started writing a novel. Okay. You want to give us just a kind of an overview we want people to buy the book so do like a a movie teaser just sort of the character <laughs> well, and it, and what happens yeah present it for your consideration the world is screwed no <laughs> <laughs> well that's succinct yeah well, I, okay I, I i i recommend people turn to book one book one is a actually a very simple book about one year in a small town actually the small town i live in black mountain north carolina they're, the whole nation is hit, but what happens in that one small town for the next year? So that's the beginning book, and then there's a couple of others, one year after, obviously a year later, final day, and then the current one picks up the story five years after a major EMP. I remember people building bomb shelters and fallout shelters oh, yeah. as, a little, as a little kid. Uh, I can remember the run, duck, and cover uh, which which I think is funny now to look at, you know, to hide under that little desk in your school uh, in case of a nuclear bomb. But, I mean, how much could one save food and water and build a shelter? Uh, you would have to be completely off-grid to keep your lifestyle, wouldn't yes, you? you are. Your own generator, your own water supply, yeah? Well, you know... I've talked to a lot of conferences and meetings and such. You got your nuts out there, you know. The ones who are sitting on top of a fortress on top of a hill going, if you come near me, I'm going to kill you. Right. I mean, those are just weirded out survivalists, which I detest. But there are a lot of people who, you know, they start with putting a month's worth of food and supplies on hand, and they gradually expand out. They start to think, 
how can I help my neighbors? How can I help my community? So you have a lot of people in the middle who might have six months, even a year's worth of supplies on hand. I urge everybody, if you haven't already started, just take one year. Put some cases of water into the closet. Next time you go to the market, buy canned food and buy dried soup and such. Have a way of cooking it, you know, pro, for you guys, you know, propane stove out on the on the front deck. Uh, it doesn't take much to get you through that first month or two if you're prepared rather than wandering out in the street the next day saying, can I have a bottle of water for my child? You're not going to get it. No, and it reminds me of that uh, Twilight Zone episode. I'm not sure of the, the, the yes. title, but the one where the, there's a nuclear attack and the guy builds the shelter and then it's all out. Yes. The neighbors all come clamoring to get in. You remember that one? Yeah. Yeah, that was terrifying. And in fact, that was a bit of an inspiration for it. You notice how in a 22-minute teleplay, Rod Serling wrote it, they went from happy, fun families together for dinner to at each other's throats, ready to kill to get inside that shelter in 22 minutes. Yeah. That was a terrifying episode. Oh, it was. It was. And it just came right back. I haven't seen it in years, but when you were talking about that, i got to go look it up again now. I'm going to watch it. <laughs> and there's the other one, the monsters are due on Maple Street. Oh, yeah. A couple of aliens. Yeah. Yeah, they're just turning electricity on and off and people start freaking out. I love Twilight Zone. <laughs> oh, it's I'm a wonderful. big fan since I was a kid. I suppose a way to practice, if you will, for this would be to go camping. Yes. I mean, real or camping, even, not, not a million-dollar Winnebago motorhome. You know, right. I mean, tents and, you know, backpacks, that kind of camping. I, I can remember some years back when I was married, my wife and I decided we're going to try 72 hours with nothing at all. All electricity is off, all right? So we're eating survival food for a couple of days. And, you know, I go out and do something, come back in, and I go, do I smell Fritos on your breath? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> she had been gorging on a bag of Fritos when I wasn't looking. <laughs> How long does canned food actually last? Okay, you can go a little high tech. Uh, I recommend a site called Woot, W-O-O-T dot com. They sell survival food. You can get stuff with 20, 25-year shelf lives. Wow. But even if you just go to the local market, you know, you, you look at the little stamp on the bottom, and a lot of it's good for three, four, five years. So so the can of beans, like Heinz beans, we're, we're good for four years on that? Well, it depends on the stamp on the bottom. Uh, I was okay. cleaning out my closet last week, and I found some soup from 2017. So I threw it out. But, <laughs> yeah, and even the stuff you can buy at a market will carry you through a major crisis. We do kind of have to wind this down, but I have one last question. Is our government doing sure. anything to huh. strengthen huh. Our, our electrical grid system? Not to talk politics too much, but shortly before the end of the Trump administration, he mandated a major study by DOD, DOE, etc., to evaluate threat of EMP and what to do to start upgrading the system. The day the current administration came in, they killed it. We are doing next to nothing. I put a lot of reliance now on, don't even try with the federal government for another year. Start talking at the county level. You'd be surprised how responsive they can be, state level. This is where we're starting to make some changes. Slow, but at least we're doing something. Okay, so all the, the push to green wind power and it's not going to make any ah. difference in the end right yeah you're going to have 500 foot tall wind towers that spin aimlessly because the electricity isn't going anywhere <laughs> okay <laughs> well. yeah you, you have to laugh to keep your sanity <laughs> the the laughter is the humor of the absurd humor. yeah yeah it's yes, it's it a, because man thinks he's so infallible and, oh, we're going to fight climate change and we're going to build these huge towers that have their own effects on nature. Uh, there was a funny meme I just saw about two minutes before I got on with you. It was a picture of a Tesla that a tree had fallen down on top of and crushed it in a high windstorm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it says we're killing each other over electric cars to preserve 
nature, and nature just killed the electric car. Well, again, it's that expectation and normalcy. Everything worked yesterday. It's going to work today. It's going to work tomorrow. But a number of times in history, you suddenly woke up one morning and normalcy is gone. Something horrible has happened that we weren't prepared for. Yeah. Even 9-11 yes. falls into yeah. that category. Yeah, if the true. day before, if I pointed at the sky and said, you know, this could be turned into ballistic missiles, 787, you're crazy. It will never happen. Well, it did. Look at the impact of just losing 3,000 lives, let alone 3 million or 30 million. Yeah, it's scary to think about. Bill, we got to wind it this is. down. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. My guest is Dr. William Fortune, and the latest book is called Five Years After. It is out, right? Next week. Next comes week. Out, actually, it comes out on the 25th. On the 25th, okay. Yeah. Last question, do you have a website that you want to give out? Yeah, uh, it's onesecondafter.com, though I don't pay attention to it very much. <laughs> uh, you can check my publisher, which is uh, forgebooks.com. And, uh, you know, it, I recommend everybody just get on Facebook tonight and look up two or three short videos on what is an EMP. It will sober you up. Uh, the book is available, I assume, at Amazon and all those those places. Yes, so they used to say, where better books are sold Where everywhere. better books are sold everywhere. Okay. <laughs> well, Bill, thank, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on the show. This was very enlightening. And uh, I'm going to test my wife when I get home. See what... <laughs> and stand close to the air conditioner, okay? <laughs> <laughs> See how much she's prepared for this. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. okay. Take it's care. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Yes, likewise. Take care. Bye-bye.